In this lecture, you'll learn about ONTAP Storage QoS and how you can use it to control the performance that will be given to your workloads. Storage quality of service allows you to deliver consistent and predictable performance to your workloads in a multi-workload environment. So on your ONTAP cluster, you've got a certain amount of hardware that is there. And if you've got multiple workloads that are running on that cluster, they're all competing for the available resources. You can set a throughput ceiling on a particular workload or workloads to prevent it from bullying other workloads and taking too much of those resources and negatively impacting the other workloads. You can also set a throughput floor for a workload to give it a minimum throughput level, regardless of the demand by competing workloads. You can set a ceiling, a floor, or both to a workload or workloads. And you can also set storage QoS to only monitor throughput without actually setting a ceiling or a floor on there. A throughput ceiling limits throughput for a workload to a maximum number of IOPS or megabytes per second. You'll normally set either IOPS or megabytes per second, but you can set both. If you do set both, then the limit will kick in as soon as either one is reached. This ensures the workload does not take more than its expected share of system resources and bully the other workloads running on the system. Your throughput ceilings can be applied to a volume, a file, a LUN, or an SVM. And a throughput ceiling throttles throughput directly, meaning that if you set a limit on a volume, for example, then it will limit that volume directly. It stops it from using too much resources. Throughput to workloads might exceed the specified ceiling by up to 10% especially if a workload experiences rapid changes in throughput. And the ceiling might be exceeded by up to 50% to handle bursts. So when you do configure storage QoS, just be aware that it can sometimes go a little outside the settings that you specified. That is normal. Also, it takes some time for QoS settings to take effect, usually a few minutes. So if you do configure QoS, don't go and put in the monitoring commands immediately and then be surprised when it looks like it's not taking effect. That's also normal. It does take a few minutes to take effect. So after you configure storage QoS, go get yourself a cup of coffee and then come back and check that it's working. Okay, so that was QoS Max setting a QoS limit. We can also use... QoS min to set a QoS floor as well. A throughput floor guarantees that throughput for a workload does not fall below a minimum number of IOPS. So for when we set a ceiling, we could set the value in either IOPS or megabytes per second or both. When we set a floor, megabytes per second is not available. It's always going to be IOPS that we use here. Throughput floors can be applied to a volume, a file, or a LUN, but not SVM. When QoS first came out, it was only available for setting a ceiling. For setting a floor, that is more recently become available. So there's not quite as many options available for setting a floor right now, but in future versions of ONTAP, I expect that there will be. A throughput floor throttles throughput indirectly by giving priority to the workloads for which the floor has been set. The ONTAP system cannot tell a workload, oh, you need to send me more work, send me at least this amount. Obviously, the workload is going to send whatever it is sending. The way that the throughput floor works is that if it looks like it's not going to get the amount of resources that it needs, then ONTAP will actually limit the other workloads on the system. It will give priority to this workload to make sure that it gets at least the minimum that you've configured. Throughput to a workload might fall below the specified floor if there's insufficient performance capacity available on the node or aggregate. Yeah, obviously QoS is not magic. 
It cannot somehow magically give more performance to your workloads than is available on the underlying hardware. And even when sufficient capacity is available on that underlying hardware, throughput to a workload might fall below the specified floor by up to 5%. So just like it was with the ceiling, this is not always exact. It can sometimes go a little outside what you've set. The same caveat applies to throughput floors as well. And throughput floors are supported on AFF systems and on tap select premium with SSD. Again, like I just said, this is a newer feature. There are some limitations with it, which I expect will be removed in later versions. Okay, so let's look at how to actually configure QoS. That's done with policy groups. You define the storage floor and or ceiling in a policy group at the command line. You then add the storage objects to that policy group, which again can be volumes, files, or LUNs, or SVMs if you're setting a ceiling not supported with floors. You can define multiple policy groups and apply different QoS settings to them. So you might have different workloads that have got different requirements for the throughput floor or ceiling. To configure that, you would configure different policy groups for them. And a single or multiple storage objects can be listed in the same policy group. So if you've got, for example, multiple volumes with the same requirements, then you could configure one policy group for them and put them all in that policy group. If you had another volume with different requirements, that would require a different policy group. Best practice is to not mix different objects in the same policy group. For example, don't put volumes and LUNs in the same policy group. You could have volumes and other volumes in the same policy group, that is okay. And you cannot assign a storage object to a policy group if its containing object or its child objects belong to the policy group. For example, you couldn't have a policy group with an SVM in there and also a volume that is in that SVM. Obviously, that would create a conflict. Okay, the different types of policy groups. There's shared and also non-shared policy groups. A non-shared QoS policy group specifies that the defined throughput ceiling or floor applies to each member workload individually. For example, if you configured a non-shared policy group with a maximum throughput of 50,000 IOPS, each workload in that policy group will be limited to 50,000 IOPS. So for example, workload one can use 50,000 IOPS, workload two can also use 50,000 IOPS. So each of them get that limit that you set available to them individually. On the other hand, we've also got our shared policy groups. And for throughput ceilings, the total throughput for all workloads in a shared policy group cannot exceed the specified ceiling when it's shared. For example, same example again, if you configured a shared policy group with a maximum throughput of 50,000 IOPS, so it's the same, but this time it's shared rather than non-shared, the aggregate total IOPS of all the member workloads is limited to that 50,000 IOPS. So if workload one uses 30,000 IOPS, only 20,000 IOPS are left for workload two. So they don't get that 50,000 IOPS each, it's shared between all of them. For throughput floors rather than ceilings, the minimum is applied to each workload individually, always. For example, if the minimum is set to 5,000 IOPS, each workload in the policy group is guaranteed 5,000 IOPS. So when we're setting a ceiling, you can see there would be some scenarios where you can say, okay, I've got 50,000 IOPS available, and I'm going to make that available to these groups or these, this group of volumes. They get that 50,000 IOPS between them, and it's first come, first served. That would make sense. But setting a, a throughput floor, which was shared, doesn't really make sense at all. You couldn't say, okay, we've got 5,000 IOPS minimum, which is shared between these particular volumes. That would be applied to an individual volume. It's the only way it really makes sense. So for throughput floors, it's always applied individually. Okay, so that was our traditional storage QoS, which has been available since the feature first became available. There's also a new type of QoS, well, a newer type of QoS, which is adaptive QoS. And I'll explain the reason for that now. So storage QoS throughput for a storage object usually changes if the size of the object changes. 
For example, an increase in the amount of space used in a volume usually requires a corresponding increase in its throughput ceiling. So if a volume gets bigger and you've got QoS applied to there, as it gets bigger, you're usually going to want to give it more throughput. Now, prior to ONTAP 9.3, the throughput configured in a policy group was always fixed. So you set a particular value and it stayed the same. And if the size of the volume, for example, increased and you wanted to give it more throughput, then you would have to change the setting on the policy group manually. And if you had a lot of objects with QoS applied to them, then this is quite a lot of administrative overhead. So the new feature that helps with that is adaptive QoS. Adaptive QoS can optionally be used to automatically scale the policy group value to the workload size. Maintaining the ratio of IOPS or megabytes per second to the size in terabytes or gigabytes as the size of the workload changes. So as the size of the volume goes up, it will get more throughput. If it goes down, it will get less throughput. And when adaptive QoS is used, it's typically used to adjust throughput ceilings rather than floors. The workload size is expressed as either the allocated space for the storage object or the space actually used by the storage object. I'll explain that now. So when you use allocated space, an allocated space policy maintains the IOPS to terabyte or gigabyte ratio according to the nominal size of the storage object. For example, if the ratio is 100 IOPS per gigabyte, a 300 gigabyte volume will have a throughput ceiling of 30,000 IOPS. And if the volume is resized to 500 gigabytes, adaptive QoS adjusts the throughput ceiling to 50,000 IOPS. So you can see here, it doesn't care how much data is actually in the volume. It's applied based on what the size of the volume is. And you can see adaptive QoS working here as the size of the volume increased, that volume was given more throughput. We've also got use space policies available as well. A use space policy maintains the IOPS to terabyte or gigabyte ratio according to the amount of actual data stored rather than the size of the object. And this is before storage efficiencies, deduplication and compression have been applied. For example, if the ratio is 100 IOPS per gigabyte again, a 300 gigabyte volume that is 100 gigabyte of data stored in it would have a throughput ceiling of 10,000 IOPS. So it's based on the amount of data in the volume, not the size of the volume itself. As the amount of use space changes, adaptive QoS adjusts the throughput ceiling according to the ratio. So with the, the last one, the allocated space, if you have set up the system with volume auto grow, then this is where that would be most likely to take effect. It would also take effect if you manually change the size of the volume. If you've got auto grow set on there and the volume auto grows, then this would give it more throughput. When you're using used space, it's not going to be just based on auto grow. As the actual amount of data in there changes, then the amount of throughput allocated will change in line with that. Our adaptive QoS policy groups are always non-shared. The defined throughput ceiling or floor applies to each member workload individually. So we don't have shared with adaptive QoS. And when a workload changes size, updates to the QoS policy take around five minutes to take effect. So just like when you first configure a policy, it's going to take around five minutes to take effect. With adaptive QoS, if the actual size of the volume or the data in the volume changes, that's going to take about five minutes after that to update as well. And I've been using a volume as an example, but adaptive QoS can also be used for your files, your LUNs as well. Okay, with adaptive QoS, there's actually some default adaptive QoS policies that are built into the system. As soon as you install and enable the cluster, these default adaptive QoS policy groups will be there. The defaults are value, performance, and extreme. And it's pretty obvious from the name that extreme gives you the best performance, value is the least performance. So with value, that's suitable for email, web, and file shares. And you can see on the, the display here of what the actual expected absolute peak and expected latency values are. Expected IOPS, that is the minimum. So with value, if you apply that to a volume, the volume will get 128 IOPS per terabyte. 
the absolute min IOPS. What that is for is, let's say that you've set up a volume, you've put an adaptive QoS policy on there, and it's a new volume, so there's no data in it. Well, because of that, when it's there, it's got no data in it. Because you're scaling based on the amount of data, it's that's going to be zero. So it would be given zero IOPS. And obviously, you don't want that to happen. You want it to have a minimum. So the absolute minimum is the lowest value it can fall to. So when there is no data in the volume, it will be using the absolute minimum IOPS. When it gets up to a level that is above that, that's when the expected IOPS will kick in or the peak IOPS. And that is going to be then scaling in line with the actual amount of data that is in that volume. So expected IOPS, that is a QoS floor. The peak IOPS, that is the QoS ceiling. And the absolute minimum is the absolute minimum that it will be allowed. That's for when the volume is empty. And also showing in the slide here, you can see the expected latency. That is the, the kind of latency that would be expected if this particular adaptive QoS policy is applied. So we've got value, we've also got performance, which has got higher values, it's gonna give better performance, and then extreme, which is the best. So performance would be suitable for databases, hypervisors like VMware. Extreme is suitable for your workloads that require the lowest latency. Okay, last thing to tell you about the storage QoS workflow, you usually specify the throughput limit when you create the policy group. But if you've got a workload and you don't know what actual values to set and the vendor of that particular workload does not release values for that, so you've got no idea what you should set the actual maximum throughput to, then you can create a policy group and not actually set any values on there, in which case it will do monitor only. So you would do this if you do want to set a maximum or a minimum value for a particular workload, but you don't know where to set it to, you can configure it to monitor it first. You can then view what the actual throughput that it is using is, and then you can base your values based on that. Thanks for watching. If you want to get hands-on practice with NetApp Storage for free on your laptop, then you can download my free ebook, which you can see above my head right now. Also check out my NetApp Storage Complete course, which will teach you everything you could possibly want to know about ONTAP. Thanks.